did you know? Game Freak originally intended for every copy of Gen 1 to be personalized, but Shigeru Miyamoto told them to make different color versions instead. In Gen 1's release version, when you boot up a new game, it randomly assigns you a trainer ID number between 1 and 65,000. 535. This ID system is actually a leftover from a time when there were 65,535 different versions planned. Last year, Did You Know Gaming spent thousands of dollars to make a video series about a lost Pokédex only released in Japan in an official 1996 book simply titled Pokédex, which we had translated by Nabogasawara, the man who translated the original Pokémon games. That Pokédex book also includes an eight-page interview with every developer who worked on Pokémon, including programmers programmer Takenori Oda, where he says, We also considered having each game generate a random ID number the first time it was booted up, and that number would determine which Pokémon appeared in the game. This crumb of information piqued our curiosity, so DYKG's been translating every Japanese interview we could get our hands on ever since, now totaling over 100 pages. Eventually, we found a little more info in the November 1997 issue of Famimaga 64, this time from Game Freak's founder Satoshi Tajiri. Looking back on Pokémon's development, Tajiri said, The shape of a forest, the Pokémon that appear, I wanted to make a game that would be different for everyone, but it was difficult. So I went to consult with Shigeru Miyamoto from Nintendo, and we ended up deciding to make it so, depending on the color, whether red or green, the worlds would be parallel, but different. This statement told us that not only were the Pokémon in each cartridge all different, but even Kanto itself was, with locations changing based on your trainer ID number. Eventually, we translated the biggest Satoshi Tajiri interview ever published, which was conducted in May 2000 and printed in a 600-page book called Pokémon Story. The interview itself is 34 pages long, and we'll publish it in its entirety in the future, but for now, we just want to highlight the part where Tajiri says every cartridge was like a different world. He said, So, we randomly assigned auto-generated ID numbers from 1 to 65,000 to every game cartridge. With the cartridge IDs randomly determined, Pokémon caught in those games would all carry that ID number. So long as someone wasn't trading with 65,000 different people, the odds of trading with someone with the same ID were unlikely. With both parties having different numbers, their Pokémon would be entering different worlds when traded. Then, once the number is assigned, it would never change throughout the course of the game. I talked to Miyamoto about how we'd make players understand that every cartridge is different when they buy one, and he told me the system sounded interesting, but it was a bit difficult to grasp. He said if players can't tell just by looking at it, then it won't work out, and it would be better if the game's color or appearance were different. I was shocked when I was allowed to do that. I told him it would really help me out if I could. So, it was from trying to differentiate ID numbers that the idea to symbolically change the colors came about. I thought we should do it, but alter the colors for real. We needed to do more to make the different color games have all kinds of details in them that were a bit different. Here, Tajiri says 65,000, but the exact number was 65,535, which is the highest number that can be represented by an unsigned 16-bit binary number. Or, to put it in simpler terms, 65,535 is the biggest number you can use on a Game Boy without slowing down the entire game and overcomplicating the programming. There were only nine developers working on Pokémon, so it's difficult to imagine they'd try to build 65,000 different versions of Kanto by hand, especially since it took them six years just to make the base game. So, Game Freak probably would have had to use randomly generated landscapes, similar to what they did a few years later in the Pokémon Mystery Dungeon games on Game Boy Advance and DS. Randomly generated environments were possible on the original Game Boy and can be found in games like Dragon Quest Monsters and Shiren the Wanderer, but those games came out after Pokémon had already released. Though there was at least one Game Boy title with random dungeons that came out before Pokémon, a 1991 game called Cave Noir. However, it was so simple that Tajiri probably would not have been satisfied with that level of quality. And his idea was slightly different, in that the game was not going to randomize during gameplay, but rather all at once right from the beginning, which meant Tajiri was swimming in uncharted waters, and it sounded like he was having difficulties wrapping his head around such an ambitious idea. Pokémon did break new ground in many ways, like being the first game to allow trading through the Game Boy Link cable, but producing 65,000 Kantos would have been significantly more complicated. In that 34-page interview, Tajiri went on to say that after Miyamoto convinced him to give up on the idea for 
65,000 different versions of Gen 1, he still wanted to make between 5 and 7 different color versions, but he realized even 7 iterations of the same game would be… tricky. Not only in terms of development, but even outside forces like the factory not wanting to produce multiple cartridges and packaging for what they viewed as an identical product. So eventually, he had no choice but to settle for less. In Satoshi Tajiri's biographical manga, there's a 6 page interview where Miyamoto tells us what happened next. He says, I came up with the slogan, the game begins when you choose a cartridge, and we made models for three colors, red, green, and blue. Then later in development, we narrowed it down to just two versions, and it looked like we were going to use red and blue. But we ultimately decided that Venusaur's design was so good that we released red and green instead. And so, over the course of a few months, 65,000 variations were whittled down to just two, featuring different version exclusive Pokémon, different encounter rates, and various other small changes, like which Pokémon you can buy at the game corner. This format of releasing two different color versions of nearly identical games continued into all future generations. However, it's a fun thought experiment to consider how different the series might have been if Miyamoto left Game Freak to their own devices. If there had been 65,000 different versions of Kanto, presumably the same format would have been carried over into Johto, Hoenn, Sinnoh, and every other Pokémon region. Just imagine playing with your friends and looking over their shoulder to see how different their world is compared to yours. Or, to put it in more modern terms, imagine watching your favorite Let's Player as they explore a game with details you'll likely never experience firsthand. And just think about what it would have done for replayability. But these are far from the only secrets we've discovered on our journey, so we figured we'd share all the other development secrets within those hundred pages of interviews, like that Gen 1 almost didn't have multiplayer Pokémon battles, and that the only player-to-player -player interactions would have been buying, selling, and trading Pokémon to and with each other. In fact, multiplayer battles only barely made it in at the last minute because Nintendo demanded it, and since the big N was funding development, Game Freak had no choice but to comply. But they did it in the laziest way possible, a system where you just watched Pokémon fight on their own, with zero input from the player. Gen 1 programmer Shigeki Morimoto explains it best in that 1996 Pokédex book, saying, President Tajiri had wanted us to implement battling for a while, but I personally didn't find the idea very interesting, and just thought it would be a pain to program. It looked like we would run out of time and would have to scrap the battling feature, but Nintendo Nintendo made it clear they wanted battles in the game, so we had to make it happen. So I just thought, well, no choice then, it has to be done. And the early battles were something you just watched. You would just see there was a battle, and who won, and who lost. We showed that to Nintendo, and the surveys we got back called it boring. Uh, I guess they were right, but we were cutting it close to the deadline, trying to add in battles that the player commands. Uh, ultimately, it's what everyone wanted, so we got it to work with the link cable, and made it a reality. So Satoshi Tajiri was also in that interview and helped explain how in-game currency would have helped make up for the lack of PvP battles. Every Pokémon would have had a specified monetary value, and you'd purchase them at in-game stores or buy and sell with your friends. According to Tajiri, the only reason the focus on cash ended up being cut was due to hardware limitations. He said, In Pokémon's early development, you could buy Pokémon with money, but that resulted in the player focusing on saving money to buy them, and less motivation to struggle catching them in the wild. We also thought about making one player pay money in addition to their trade when there was an obvious difference in the value of two Pokémon being traded, but implementing Pokémon monetary values was beyond the limits of our programming. Transferring money in the game is very different from wiring money in real life, and there were difficulties getting it to work on the Game Boy. There were just too many obstacles to overcome to make it happen. We had no choice but to focus on what we wanted most and give up on the rest. In this case, being able to trade Pokémon was our top priority, so we cut the monetary value feature. Adding a little more info, Game Freak developer Akihito Tamisawa wrote a book in 2000 where he says, In the initial plan, every town had a shop that sold Pokémon, so you could buy tons of them if you had enough money. But what was once thought of as an outstanding idea to have Pokémon stores ultimately got cut. In Gen 1's final build, there are still a few Pokémon you can buy, like a Magikarp for 500 Poké Dollars, and a few more like Scyther and Porygon at the Celadon Game Corner, but buying Pokémon was originally a much 
much more central mechanic. And we can see one of these Pokemon stores in some of Ken Sugimori's earliest concept art back when the game was still called Capsule Monsters. Even HP bars almost got cut in development. Game Freak only made action games prior to working on Pokemon, so much of Red and Green's development was spent fumbling around in the dark. They wanted to make Pokemon as simple to understand as possible. So, they removed the use of numbers wherever they could, even in Pokemon battles. In a 2019 issue of Famitsu Weekly, Junichi Masuda said, Of course we thought Tajiri's idea was fun and exciting, but we had a problem. We didn't have any experience making RPGs. In the final game, HP is displayed with a meter, but at one point in development it was represented with text. We came up with 16 different statuses, descriptions like, they're still okay, or it's gonna get pretty bad soon. But it wasn't very interesting, so we scrapped it. And in the July 2000 edition of Nintendo Online Magazine, Masuda explained that incoming damage worked the same way with phrases like, that hurt, and that really hurt, to give players some idea of how much damage they'd taken. But ultimately, they realized that the entire system just kinda sucked, so they replaced it with the standard HP system used in most other RPGs. Another scrapped idea we want to talk about is how Gen 1 was originally played for keeps, where if you lost a battle, you lost your Pokémon. In Nintendo Online Magazine, the original Pokémon designer Ken Sugimori said when Satoshi Tajiri first came to him and was trying to explain the Pokémon concept, he said it would be like the Menko cards they played with when they were kids. In case you're not familiar, Menko comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. Kids collect these cards and can use them to play a game sort of like battling. Then in the end, the winner gets to keep some of the loser's cards. In Famimaga 64 magazine, Tajiri said he originally planned for Pokemon battles to play out in a similar fashion. The interviewer asked, Don't you think it would be interesting if when you lost a Pokemon battle, your opponent took your Pokemon? Like with Menko cards? And Tajiri replied, Actually, I made something like that as a prototype. But in the end, the frustration of having Pokemon you raised taken away from you was too great, so I scrapped that idea. Pokémon's first generation took a lot of twists and turns over the course of its six-year production, and it's fun to think about just how different the series might have been if they hadn't altered direction at various points in development. We know some of you prefer to read these interviews in their entirety, so today we published a bunch of them in text form. You can find links in the pinned comment below. Did you know gaming put a ton of research into this video? So if you enjoyed it, please give it a like and share it with a friend. And if you want more Pokémon facts, DYKG did a whole video on debunking Pokémon myths you can watch right now. Want to see a real Gen 1 Japan-only lecture by Professor Oak and Bill found in this same book too? We just posted that video over on my channel, Loxton and Noggin, which you can check out here. And we also want to give a big thanks to our Japan-based translator, Jacob Newcomb, and Hi-Rez Pokemon for providing page scans. Thanks for watching.